welcome Hoosier fans to a late and disappointed episode of the Assembly Call as tonight your Indiana Hoosiers fell to Illinois 75 to 71 in overtime which drops the Hoosiers to 9 and 8 on the season and 4 and 6 in the Big 10. Uh, th- this was a game that IU played well in in spurts but a lengthy drought offensively toward the end of regulation that spilled into overtime was really Really what did it, IU had a nice run at the end of the first half uh, to go into the locker room up seven, did not play well at all out of the locker room and gave that lead back pretty quickly, but did did push it back up to 66-60 to 60, uh, at one point in the second half and a couple Trent Frazier threes later and a sequence of 13 possessions where IU scored twice that spanned the end of regulation and the start of overtime really spelled doom for IU as they uh, scored just three points in the overtime, all of those coming within the final minute uh, and really struggled to get anything going offensively. And uh, if you will look back on this as another game that was uh, could have been one in regulation, no different than uh, looking back at the Florida state overtime loss, the double overtime loss to Wisconsin. This was a game that IU was in position to win. They had gotten IO to soon move fouled out of the game. So there would be no late game heroics from him. And they had Illinois in foul trouble, had him in the double bonus for for quite some time, and just didn't take advantage of those opportunities down the stretch and uh, ended up scoring just 30 points total between the second half and overtime. And that offensive uh, offensive lull was really what, what did IU in as much as anything, even though they had you know made some mistakes and squandered some opportunities earlier. It was ultimately that inability to execute down the stretch uh, that was the difference in the game. I'm your host, Andy Bottoms, and I'm here with Coach Brian Tonsoni and Ryan Phillips, and we're going to break it all down for you on this edition of the Assembly Call IU Post Game Show, although given the time here in the uh, Eastern Time Zone, we may try to keep it a little bit shorter than normal, uh, that and perhaps not wanting to talk about the game all that much, but uh, we'll start this show the way we start every show, and that is with our banner moment. Uh, there were a couple plays late uh, that were were big from Armand Franklin, so I'm going to I'm going to go with those if uh, for no other reason than perhaps they remind me of times that IU actually at one time IU actually scored in a key situation down the stretch. But uh, Armand did a couple couple nice things down the stretch. He drew a charge uh, on Io Desunmu to foul him out of the game with the game tied at 66 all. Um, that was not a good call. So uh, I do give him credit for being there and uh, and trying to draw the charge, but it wasn't a good call. But uh, with IU down too late, he took the ball, drove into the lane could argue that he potentially got fouled as he put one in, tied it, and sent it to overtime. And just a you know, big moment from him. He's playing hobbled, as, as Archie's talked about earlier this week. Uh, played a lot of minutes tonight because uh, every other guard was in foul trouble, although I think Armand eventually fouled out uh, when IU was fouling intentionally at the end. But He did. Um, it, it, but I thought a, a kind of gutty performance by him, not, not great at times, but when IU needed him in that moment at the end, he really stepped up. And quite frankly, they needed to get him the ball more in overtime to give him chances to do that, to get somebody that was going downhill that would put a little bit of pressure uh, on the defense. But again, as part of you know his maturation and, and evolution this season, good for me to see him really step up in a key situation, get IU a big bucket late uh, that sent it to overtime, even though uh, the eventual result was, was not what we would have hoped. Uh, but that will be uh, tonight's banner moment. And our banner, banner moment, as always, is brought to you by our friends at uh, at Homefield Apparel, uh, now in their fourth season of sponsoring the Assembly Call. With winter here and hoodie weather officially now arrived and uh, single digit to negative temperatures arriving uh, over the weekend in many parts of the Midwest, you need to make your way to their website at homefieldapparel.com. Have something unique for everyone, especially IU fans, and all of their apparel is printed on the softest, warmest, most comfortable, and most washable materials you'll find anywhere. A few suggestions. Uh, earlier this week, I wore my uh, Delaware Fighting Blue Hens hoodie, which was uh, which was nice and comfortable for uh, working from home. And they got a lot of new schools. They put on an Alabama basketball shirt, uh, some BYU gear they dropped last week as well. So they continue uh, to release things from other schools. I think Winthrop is another one that they uh, they released recently as well. Uh, and based on that, as you can tell, it's not just IU gear, even though the IU gear is spectacular. Uh, Homefield has apparel from more than 90 different colleges and universities now, new ones being added all the time. Their designs are so unique, interesting, and vintage that you may end up like Coach and I, buying shirts and hoodies for schools that you barely heard of just because you like the designs. And you can always save on your Homefield order by using the promo code ASSEMBLY20 at checkout. It'll give you 20% off your entire order throughout the year. So go to assembly or so go to homefieldapparel.com, load up your shopping cart, and enter the code ASSEMBLY20. Assembly 20 at checkout to get 20% off. Again, that's homefieldapparel.com. 
All right, well, it's time to move the ball, find the open man, get some opening thoughts from the rest of our team. Uh, Ryan, what's your rant on tonight's disappointing IU loss? Yeah, and I, I you know, I, I Andy got on me in our group text, and it was a fair criticism. He said, "Does the constant negativity that I keep spewing in our in our group in game text does it make me feel better?" No, it doesn't. But I, I have I have nowhere to go but negative with this team right now. I mean, it was nice seeing Christian Lander play some, and I'm I'm happy for his development. Jordan Geronimo has shown some things over the last week or so, or last two weeks or so. Uh, but I'm tired of watching the same game over and over and over again where IU plays really close to a pretty decent team and then wilts down the stretch, can't get an open shot and loses as a result and and has one defensive possession where they leave a guy open and, and he hits a shot or, 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 or doesn't rotate properly and somebody gets a dunk and that's the game. And, and I'm sorry, but in, in the last five minutes in overtime, Indiana couldn't do anything offensively. The only thing that saved them was that Al Durham kept going to the free throw line. I mean, it, it, I, I just, I don't, I'm tired of watching this same thing for the last four years. We get close and then you're in the game and you're playing pretty tight with the team, even if you're not playing well. And then you just wilt down the stretch and can't find open shots. And I don't know how, after seeing that time and time again, you can't try and do something different. And, and it just seems like it's the same. It's, Typically, not always the same guys, but a similar grouping of guys on the floor. And there's nothing special. They just run their normal offense, even when it doesn't work. And there's no sets that are designed to open things up or change things. Indiana got three points in overtime. I think they got a free throw and race Thompson hit a hook shot over somebody with, you know, when he was trying to get it, get something up quickly. It wasn't like it was out of the offense getting a wide open shot. And, and I just... After all this time, how does nothing change? And this has been years of this. We've had this. We play close and lose. Play close and lose. Play close and lose. And in what felt like, I mean, it's not a must win, but it feels like a must win after some of the losses this year. Losing to Rutgers, losing to Northwestern, getting stomped by Purdue on your home floor. This felt kind of like a must win after like a week off. And Indiana came out and led by seven at the half. And only scored 30, what, 30 points the rest of the way? Like, you don't win basketball games that way. Like, what are you doing that to make this better? And, you know, they shot 67% from the free throw line. They had 34 opportunities for free points and only made 23 of them. A lot of that's Ray Thompson missing six of them. But, you know, those are free points. And Archie Miller's teams don't shoot well from the free throw line. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go in on Trace Jackson Davis, too. I, I don't know. I mean, I'm glad that he never has to face Kofi Coburn again. Because for some reason, when he faces that guy, he just refuses to go at him. The two times he went at Kofi Coburn's chest, he scored. He had a dunk one time because he spun off him for an easy dunk. And the other time, he got an and one. Other than that, he's trying to shoot over him. He's trying to go around him and throw weird angle shots off the backboard. He was six of 18 from the field. It's like if you're an All-American who wants to go to the NBA, you got to do better than that when you face a really good player. You got to show up. And, and he was just trying. He, he, he's soft against him. I'm sorry. He played well on the defensive boards. He had four. He had or on the re, on. Uh, he, he played well on the boards. He had 14 rebounds. But offensively, when nothing's going on, the one thing you should be able to rely on is throwing into your best player and have him do something. And all night, Trace Jackson Davis just, you know, either passed the ball back out, tried to shoot a jumper, or tried to go around with a weird angle on uh, on on Kobe Coburn. Like that's not winning basketball. And so I'm just tired of, of seeing the same stuff happen. I mean, what happened in overtime was entirely predictable. And what happened late in the game was entirely predictable. And that's what's disappointing. And that's why I'm negative about this team. It's just frustrating. Like it doesn't get better. You're not, you're not like gradually seeing improvement for the team. You're seeing it a, a little bit in individual players, but in general, you're just not seeing improvement. And, and you know, as a fan, what, if I'm a normal fan, if I don't have this show, why would I want to watch that? Why? Just so I can get disappointed again? It's, it's frustrating, and I'm not sure where we go from here because there's no light at the end of the tunnel. There's no progress, and it's just annoying. I'm just sick of it after four years. Coach, opening thoughts on IU's 75-71 loss to Illinois. Yeah, it's it's a um, margin of error is small for Indiana, and it's it, the, it gets smaller when you don't have – you know, when when you have a guy that's coach's decision not playing, that's a, a post player, and and you got to count on some minutes uh, from guys that, you know, you might not 
necessarily count on as much. So the margin of error is thin to start out with, um, you know, and, and we've discussed that over and over again. And, and then when you have a few people that you count on that, that don't play their best, um, you know, they're given effort, but they're not playing their best. TJD being one of them. I thought this was, um, you know, I thought Al Durham really struggled tonight. Um, in, in a lot of areas other than the, the first two shots that he hit, I thought he came out on fire, but the margin for error is small. Um, and, and when you're coaching a team and the margin for error is small and, and two of your better players have poor performances, um, you know, you, you got to fight and fight and fight. And I thought Indiana fought, fought and fought. They just weren't good enough tonight, uh, to win. Um, and, and you know, most teams, if, if you, have your top two players uh, or two of your top two players not play well, uh, they're going to be in a struggle to get in the game. And, and, you know, I I understand the frustration. I'm frustrated as much, but, you know, um, you have a senior who free throw violates on a free throw, given one extra point and and you you lose in overtime. Um, Who was it? I thought it was Geronimo. It was, it was Geronimo and L uh, Durham, but I thought they called it on Durham. Okay. Um, you, you have a guy who played well, I thought, tonight in Lander, but his first possession, he throws it off the shoulder. He throws it off the shoulder of Race Thompson, and they go down and, and get two free throws. I mean, that's that's not in any game plan. So there's three points right there that, you know, um, you know, we got gifted two on a technical – uh, or early on. So, but it's still the, the, those points aren't in, in a scouting report. You don't expect your point guard to throw it to a guy who's not looking. Um, I guess you could argue that that's bad practice habits or whatever else, but the young man was nervous and, and he just threw it off of the shoulder and that's two points. But, but those are, those are, uh, some, some points. And, and I would urge everyone, I know everyone's about ready to jump ship and that's fine. You're entitled to jump ship. I mean, there's other teams to watch. Um, but I'm going to keep watching cause it's Indiana. I'm sorry. You, I mean, you can be frustrated. I'm frustrated. I don't like it. I'm worried about the direction of the program just as much as everyone else, but it's Indiana. It's my school. I'm going to show up. Uh, and I want guys to show up. I, if, if the players are quitting in that locker room, they can go home right now. You don't quit. If you really love something, you don't quit. You, you step up and find a way to get it done. The guys aren't doing that right now, but I thought the I thought the defensive awareness, I thought the fight was really solid tonight. The execution was not good. Um, in, in all of the things that we can point out, the execution wasn't good. And, and you know, you get Frazier hitting two threes, and just took advantage of a young kid who was trying to do the right thing by tagging a ball screen, uh, the roll defender as the ball was going away from him. He was really doing the right thing. He was doing it too hard. And, and he and a good team made him pay, and, and that got Illinois back back in the game. And then, as far as not running sets in the overtime, they ran a perfect set to get Trace Jackson Davis a post, and Armand Franklin squared up and was going to throw it in, and Trace never posted. He just ran out to the three point line. Whether that's fatigue or Kofi Coburn, uh, you know, not wanting to play hard. You, if you run a set, it's got to be executed at a time. And I, I just thought TJD. Uh, I agree. With, with you was was really uh poor the last two games and what was happened the the big kid from Rutgers gave him issues and the big kid here um gave him issues but you get the kid 18 shots um that's pretty good you know that's pretty good strategy to get your best player 18 shots but he only hit six um he's got to go better angles he's got to go at the chest he can't just flow throw away and throw a shot put uh left-handed shot up so you know I I I don't like losing. There are no moral victories. You play to win the game. You simply do. Um, but, you know, this is a top three seed in a tournament. We've lost, you know, three overtime games to top four seeds. Um, and our margin and our team is not at those levels of talent. It just isn't. Um, so we should be winning them and be negative that we're not winning them. But it's also, uh, I, I give the guys a little bit of credit for, for being close on a night when you had um, – you know, you had some limited um, availability, and, and you just got to go back and try to beat Iowa, try to beat Northwestern, and, and stay in the game. That's all That's all you can do right now. And then the des- other decisions are out of my control. So I worry about controlling my control. My control is my love of Indiana, and I love Indiana. I can control that. I can't control the decision on Archie Miller. I can't just control offense or defense. I enjoyed at least a competitive game, and it wasn't a 30-point blowout. 
I'm disappointed in the loss. They need to fix a lot of things. But you know what? On Sunday, I'm wearing my IU gear, and I hope to heck they win, and I hope they heck they put four or five games in. Rutgers lost five in a row, came back, and has won three in a row. Anything can happen in this league, and and I, I believe. I mean, that's you just got to keep fighting. I mean, adversity hits, and you got to keep fighting. And I think as fans, we got to keep fighting uh, because it, it, it's not fun, and then hope things do get fixed. And if they don't, then changes do need to be made at the appropriate time. Coach, I, I want to step in real quick and say that I love Indiana too, and I'm not going to stop watching. I'm just airing the frustration because it's oh, and that's real. You've got a guy who's a you've got a guy who's a smart coach. Like he knows basketball. There's no question. You watch Archie Miller talk about basketball. He knows basketball. How is the team not getting better after all this time? It drives me nuts because it's he clearly knows what he's talking about. But here's the question I have for you guys: as the two bracketologists in the room. Indiana's nine and eight and four and six in the Big Ten, and the schedule does not get easier. This has been, I mean, if you want to argue it, early season schedule was the easy part of the Big Ten. They now have two, they have matchups with three more ranked teams at Rutgers, three more top 10 teams, plus at Purdue, at Rutgers, Michigan State. We don't know what Michigan State is. They haven't played well, but they look like they're starting to get their sea legs under them now. I mean, if Archie Miller misses the tournament this year, when the tournament is in Indiana, is there really any way to explain how you missed the tournament in year four, especially with the, the emotional tie of the entire state being the entire tournament being in your state? I mean, can you survive that? I'm being, I'm being honest. I, I, I have been on record saying that I think that Archie Miller is back next year because of the extenuating circumstances of COVID and financial situation. But I mean, how embarrassing is that for the program? that in year four of a coach's, coach's tenure, you missed the tournament when it's entirely in your state. I mean, to me, the part about it being in Indiana is not something that you really knew going in. So it's like, of I, course not, I mean, but... it's, it's like salt in the wound, but it doesn't, I mean, to me that, that doesn't make you feel any different. I mean, if you, I'm you, it you either to the, were, it adds to it. yeah, I, I guess. I mean, I, I think the disappointment of not making it would, would be large enough that I don't, I don't know that it would really, it's it's heightened all that much by by it being in Indiana. I mean, that would obviously be disappointing based on on where they're at, and that's kind of where things are headed if they don't turn it around. I mean, I had him as an eleven this week, and probably be in my last four in. I would guess if I did another one tonight, which I'm not going to do at twelve twelve a.m. Um, but it, it, like Coach said, I mean, there, there's opportunities to turn around. The, the, if you want to look at the positive, and pretty much any game they play is going to help the the resume, and there's really no. Uh, eventually the the volume of losses hurts but um you know there aren't aren't bad games there but so so let's kind of attempt to to shift gears and talk about a few of the different components of the game so let's let's talk i guess what i'm going to call late game offense late game execution whatever whatever you want to say you know i use in the double bonus they scored on three uh, maybe seven straight possessions at one point in the second half. I think that's what got it to the 66 to 60 lead. And they made free throws on, they got to the free throw line on five of those seven. Now, one of those was an and one from, from trace, but, um, you know, they get to the line there, they get to the line four times, the rest of regulation and overtime, two of those were race who made them, uh, on probably a questionable foul call that I think fouled out Georgie. And then yep. the other two by Armand at the end of overtime when Illinois fouled on purpose. Um, in the midst of that, though, you've got turnover. You've got three turnovers toward the end of regulation. Uh, one of those is just the pass on the last play with you know 0.6 seconds left. So you know you can throw that one aside. You know, but but you don't score the first five possessions of overtime. Two of those are turnovers. Two of them are misses from TJD, one of which was an air ball, one of which was a miss by Al where he just had to force stuff in the lane. There there were not, to me, enough possessions that ended with Armand Franklin taking the shot. In fact, the only one that ended with that until he went to the free throw line was the one that he made to tie the game. Yeah. So, so Coach, I guess, you know, and, and you made the point about the TJD play. In, in that scenario, like, what do you attribute that to? You got a whole bunch of guys kind of dribbling side to side, and everybody by that point is completely gassed between the foul trouble, between Jerome making off court decisions that that render him unplayable, and and you basically have hardly anybody left. But who do you put that on 
Um, I'm I'm not trying to get you to take sides coaching, you know, coach versus whatever, but like, who do you put that on? Cause he was maybe the guy that could get it going. Cause I think we knew what you were getting from trace at that point, unless you're getting him on like a hard roll to the basket, he wasn't going to necessarily go hard to the rim. Yeah. I think when, when did fantasy fall out? Did he fall out in regulation? He fell out in regulation toward okay, the, so, so toward here's the what end when he in, got caught behind yep. Frazier on that inbounds play. In overtime, your two, your two best point guards are out. Two point guards, well, when Rob is playing well, can go downhill. I thought Christian Lander was fantastic tonight, despite the the two threes and the and the fouling the three point. Um, I, I just, I, I'm almost to a point where it's time to turn it over. Um, to be brutally honest with you, I, I'm uh, there. The he flows. <laughs> He flows. He can hit shots. He can. You're going to have to live with some issues uh, defensively, maybe with him. But I was so pleased with him. You have no downhill guys. That's why Galloway played in in the overtime. But what they did is you, you don't have a threat. You, you didn't have many threats. They really uh, shut down. Galloway couldn't find an edge. And yeah, Armand, he really struggled tonight with the athleticism. Of the well, defense. the first half he didn't. He broke him down yeah, and got okay a couple nice half. assists. But the but the overtime they they shut him down and then Armand's ankles really yeah. uh, he struggled tonight I think he gutted it out and I, I'm re- I mean I love Armand um, but it's obvious that he's at sixty sixty five percent that drive was the best that you were going to get um, yeah. and, and I think that um, it was just hard for him to go north south and, and it's been one of the things that's hurt Indiana all year is the guards aren't good north south uh, Al Durham's not good going north south Al Durham is a catch and shoot three guy um, off the bench in, in, in my opinion on most Big Ten teams um, and, and we're trying to win with him in a major part and he's working hard and he's doing good things and I love the guy but the, the reality sets in that um, I, we have some we have some guys on this team that would be coming off the bench on 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 really good Big Ten teams and, and we're trying to win with them and that's that margin of error is so small, so you get into overtime. Uh, well, the last shot was a really bad one at forty two seconds. Uh, I mean, Trace Jackson Davis takes just a really bad semi hook shot over Kofi Coburn from twelve feet. I mean. The play was designed to get him the ball in the post, and he floated out, and then he caught it, and then he wanted to do something with it. He wants to win, and he takes just a really bad shot. That's just a bad decision by a kid who wanted to win. Um, soft, but I mean, it was yeah, soft. and and, and the, there were you know a couple. I, I don't know the possessions exactly in overtime. I didn't chart them tonight, but um, you know they know you want to go into Trace Jackson Davis as well, and and Illinois only scored what one or two I mean I was watching Twitter from national guys they were bored with the game because Illinois wasn't scoring in the last six minutes you know we look at it from the Indiana perspective but Indiana uh, Illinois offense wasn't very good either um in the last six minutes or overtime they made one more play that was the Curbelo pass there to make it four points uh when the shot clock that's all I mean they had one maybe two baskets more in overtime but they were pitiful uh in overtime as well so you know, it gets it gets to the stress level of, of games and execution. It gets to the other teams, both teams locking up a little bit defensively because they know each possession is important, and the fatigue. And it just comes down to who's making plays. And, and Indiana's right now just not making enough plays at Wisconsin, at Florida State. They're not making them, they're, and that's why they're losing. They're getting close, and they're not making the plays, and it's got to get fixed. But um, that's what I attribute it to. Um, you you, you got to – Indiana didn't have a playmaker, they didn't have a closer, and their post player was struggling. Uh, draw me up a set to get a, to get points consistently with that out yep. there. Um, that, that's just honest, and that's not the kid's fault. It's not the coach's fault. It's just at that point of the game, it was going to be a struggle, and you had to find a way, and it had to be gutty. And, and Indiana just lost the, the gutty battle. They had IU out, um, you know, so they had their closer out. They were down a closer. But you had Frazier, you had your point guard, Cubello, who gets a lot of assists. Um, they had a few more pieces in at overtime than Indiana di- did. And to me, that's why Indiana lost in overtime. Yeah, look, you fouled Ayo Desunmu out with how many minutes? This was like, like, it was like five minutes left or four minutes left. And you couldn't find a way to beat Illinois in that scenario. I mean, that that's on everybody. You know, I'm not, I'm not just blaming the coaches, but it's as a team – you didn't have the guy that is going to dagger you, you know, on, on the opposing team. It, you know, I mean, we all love what IO can do on the floor. And, and part of the thing that makes him great is he hits clutch shots and Indiana 
that you know, and the the officials gave that to IU on a bad charge call, but still, you had that going for you. You had a lot of bad calls in this game that went both ways, but you had a lot you a go in your favor that we complain about on the road, and you know, finally got some to go in your favor. You out rebounded them, and you somehow didn't win, and 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 that goes to the whole program because there's no killer instinct. There's nobody who is willing to take over. Late. I don't care. If, See, if I think your, Armand has that in him. I to, think he does to, too. To try but he to didn't tonight. Positive, it, but yeah, he didn't you know, tonight because I don't know if he's, he's healthy. And, and again, I know sure. I know people will DM me and say I'm an excuse maker. But you know, when you got a bad ankle. Um, it's hard. You got to pick your That's spots. Fine. But I, I think eventually the closer on this on this team is going to be Armand Franklin. And I really, I, I there's don't no doubt that Trace Jackson you. Davis is the best player. Armand Franklin is the second. And, uh, and he didn't have a good game tonight, but I think that's because he's just fighting it, fighting it right now. Yeah, so I agree with you, Coach, that I think that Armand can be a closer. I, I absolutely agree, and I think earlier in the season he showed, you know, through the run of games that he's definitely got that ability. He hasn't really had big buckets late consistently, but I think he, he'll get there because just his attitude and, and, the, and the way he attacks. Obviously, tonight he's injured. Okay, I'll take that as an excuse because he legitimately does have an ankle injury. But here's the thing. You didn't have anybody else realize or, or, or say to themselves, Armand's hurting. I need to step up. And the fact that there's not enough dog in some of these guys to step up, I agree. The effort I was agree there with you tonight. right there. The effort was there tonight. It was. But, but it wasn't finishing, good effort. That, it was that killer it instinct finish. Yeah, there's nobody. Trace Jackson Davis didn't say, all right, Armand, you know what? Back up. I'm taking this. and I'm going to go right at this guy, and I'm going to beat him. Here's here's a couple get things. the ball like, and and he get the ball and try and go over him. You know that little race, shot you talked about. When did race fumble that post move? Was that was that in over overtime? I think that was at the end of regulation. He had a wide open post feed and he fumbled the pass and then he had to try to fall out of bounds and he turned yeah. it over. Uh, Armand Franklin gets a, a steal from Durham and goes three on one and misses one at the rim and the ball goes out of bounds uh, yeah. and he, and it doesn't score. You know, so again, that's just it's it's a little bit of snake bitten. Um, There's no kill. My but here's goodness! The thing. But I mean, here's the thing: you don't here's miss the a layup there. You don't you don't free throw violate. You don't do those things if you're going to win games. Uh, agreed. And here's the thing: good teams don't do those things. And and absolutely and, and, correct. And teams teams that have that killer instinct don't do those things. And I have seen no killer instinct in four years. And I'm not saying that's all on the coaches. I'm saying it's a program-wide problem. There is no dog in Indiana where they're just like, all right, the chips are down. I'm taking over right now. Romeo did that in a game where he drove at a guy. You know, Rob Finnessy has shown a flash once or twice. We've seen Armand Franklin take over games in the middle. We've seen Trace take over games when he doesn't have a good player against him. You know, like a solid, legit post guy. He'll take over games. There's no one who's a closer, and we haven't developed or got a closer in four years. That's a problem if you want to win in the Big Ten. Because guess what? Almost every other team has a closer, and you don't. And and so you're at a strategic disadvantage every time because when the chips are down, you don't have somebody to say, here, take the ball and go win us this game. You don't have that guy. And so when you're in overtime and nothing's working offensively, because Illinois, Absolutely. hey, I agree. give Illinois credit. They played good defense in overtime and shut down everything IU was doing. They knew everything IU was going to run. They were overplaying the screens exactly where they needed to. They were anticipating Trace Jackson Davis's roles in the post, all of it. And there was nobody with 10 seconds left in the shot clock. You can go here, take this ball and go win us the game. And it's been that way for four years. And it was like that for a couple of years under the cream. It was since Yogi Ferrell. We haven't really had that guy who will just go win you a game. And that's a problem, and it's a program-wide problem. It's not just a coaching problem. It's not just a player problem. It's a program-wide problem, and it's concerning, given yeah. the level I think of we talent got to, in the state. I think once Lander gets going, he, he has that kind of attitude that I like to be a closer, and I'm interested to see what the the – the transfer that just came this semester with his ability to knock down shots. Yeah. I don't know if he's a closer, like go get one at the rim, but maybe he's a give me the ball and I'll shoot right in your eye. Um, you know, like Frazier was a little bit. We we don't have that either. That just give me, I don't care if I'm guarded, I'm going to knock this right in your face type of guy. And, and well, we're pushing again, that. that's, the, that's roster right. issues. Yeah. So, let, so let's use that to talk 
guard play before we before yeah. we take a break because I think that ultimately you know for me and and how many times have we said it all year you know how how Al and Rob play for right now determines how this team is going to play and you know Al got off to a really hot start I feel like that was the same as he did in, in one of the other recent games where he goes and hits a three early he had a couple threes in the first I think five or six possessions for IU made technical free throws I mean he had eight points you know, five minutes into the game, finishes with 13, didn't make another shot from the field uh, after that, did make five or six from the line, but um, I thought really struggled on some some things defensively, closing out, stuff that we've talked about before. You know, one assist, two turnovers, couple rebounds. Rob Finnessy didn't score, took two shots, fouled out, you know, didn't turn the ball over, didn't have any assists. I mean, again, th- those just are not performances that I you can – can survive from those guys, particularly when you're playing a bit shorthanded with Jerome Hunter. You got two guys playing hurt in in Franklin and Galloway. And and the good news was that Christian Lander really stepped up, particularly in the first half, getting 11 minutes. He ends up with six points, did foul out. Um, I use guards had 19 fouls <laughs> between the four uh, that we've talked about the most, which is uh, fairly, Just fairly, fairly impressive. Um, you know, he ends up with six points, hit a couple big threes, Two nice assists, had some other assists that that could have been there. Either somebody got fouled or, or things like that. But I thought really in the first half when he was in there, the offense had a little bit of a flow to it. And, you know, he he got himself in, in foul trouble early in the second half, kind of took himself out, had some defensive struggles. He committed four of his fouls in the second half, so he only played eight minutes. Uh, and I think that ultimately was the difference because I think Archie was pretty much willing to ride it out with him until he fouled yep. out. Um, and that was the only way he was putting Rob back in, which quite honestly felt felt like the right decision. And I think, coach, to your that point, he put him in right after the foul on the three pointer, right? Just I think let, that's when he fouled out. That's when back. he fouled out, though. Oh, he fouled out. You're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. If we could go back, and I don't know what the I don't have the stats up here. Plus minus were though, but think about the stretch where Indiana got the lead in the first half. Who was out there? Christian Lander. Four. Who got the lead in the second half? Who was out there? Christian Lander. At the beginning of the first half, it was Rob Finnessy and L. Durham. At the end of the half, it was L. Durham and Rob Finnessy when, when it, got, it got back out. I, I, know, I know Lander was there when they hit the two threes, so that's unfair yeah. to say there. He also gave that up. But uh, I, I'm telling you, I saw enough of Christian Lander tonight uh, to know that he can run the offense and he's coming along. And his defensive errors tonight were because he was trying hard. He yeah. was not in the right position. He still made mistakes. He still needs to be accountable in the film room. But the one time he got driven baseline, he closed out and he he lunged through the passing lane. The guy caught and was able to do a straight line drive. He's got that you're not lunged through the passing lane. The others on that ball screen coverage, he was running to tag when he didn't have to. He has to learn how to split the difference. And if the ball goes to the tag, then he goes inside. If the ball comes back, because almost every ball screen team takes the ball to the right, jumps up in the air, and throws it back to the left because they know most teams rotate off that. They leave that weak side shooter open, uh, so they purposely run it to the weak side shooter. He got caught in that because he was one step out of position because he was trying too hard to prevent that tag because he knows for Archie you got to play defense. But what I saw today, uh, even it, it wasn't total lost out there defensively. It was, um, but I thought Indiana's offense ran smoother. I thought the sets ran better. I thought the way he bounces out there and gets people going, little lackadaisical on his entry passes for me. You know, you worry about someone jumping that uh, once in a while. But you know, the other guards tossed it around. Uh, Al Durham had a couple yeah. just entry passes to the elbow that got stolen, um, and, and Rob was was not penetrating. And, and boy, the threat of him coming off that screen, and, and then he hits two threes. Um, you know, if, if we're going to be out of the tournament and and nine and nine or nine and eight, give him some run at this point yeah. and and fix his defense. But he was a bright spot. He race um, uh, were real bright spots tonight. And and then I liked Armand and Trey for gutting it out through inj- injuries and and doing some things. Um, you know, but Lander, geez. I, it, what I, what I like, yeah, I mean, he he has, and what I liked about him was he came in and played really bad when he first came in the game. Yeah, uh, gave up a first, bucket. First gave, sequence was bad. Gave up a bucket almost immediately, and then threw the ball away on that play that coach talked about. But you know, really after that, got into a flow, was making nice nice passes on the the pick and roll where you're just like he's threading the ball into guys. Threw it one time, I think before Trace like Trace turned around, the ball was already on him, 
and yeah. and he drove in one time and threw like a corner a pass all the way out to Anthony Leal on the corner. Leal should have shot it and didn't. And you know, it just drove in and then just made in one motion made this pass. And it's like there's nobody on this team who can make that pass. Like there's nobody else on this team who makes that pass who who sees that and makes that pass. Yeah, and yeah, so I mean, he was, he was good. yeah, I mean, ultimately, out of necessity, Archie had to let him play through some of those things. And I know it's hindsight's twenty twenty, and you can't say, well, you should have let him play through these things earlier in the year, and could he have already gotten to this point? Like we we have no idea. But I think at this point, it's fair fair to question how many minutes he should really get as you move forward because he's starting to figure it out. He's the one thing that that pushes the ceiling of where this team can go a bit higher than anybody else running the show at this point. So I think that is one thing that I'm looking at heading into this next stretch of games is, is he a guy that you start to play more? He played well in limited minutes against Iowa the first time, but I just don't know how you, you know, at a certain point, I think you know what you got and maybe Rob turns it around and and puts some things together as you move forward. But I, I think you at least take the risk that Lander really is starting to figure it out as opposed to, you know, the, the devil, you know, versus the one you don't, uh, I think at that point. So I, th- well, that, that part was, a I mean, there was a lineup, sure. there was a lineup change before he put Trey Galloway in and, and, and pulled Rob out of the lineup. Um, but then you got Armand and Al handling the ball. I mean, there, there yeah, could well, be, something let's be coming real maybe down tonight. One of the best lineups we joked before the season about the four freshmen being in together. One of the best lineups in the first half was the four freshmen and race Thompson. Like they just moved the ball better and they didn't get necessarily like score every time down or anything, but they were moving the ball better. They were more athletic. They were just cutting hard. They want, it looked like they wanted to be out there. And I'm sorry, you know, Rob Finnis, he's a good kid. He did not look like he wanted to play basketball tonight. Did not look like it. And, and, and one more thing I'll say is that what Lander's situation reminds me of is an NFL team with an incumbent starting quarterback drafting a rookie quarterback high. And then it's the decision, when do you play him? When do you start, not starting him in Lander's case, but for the metaphor to work, when does the NFL team turn the offense over? And when you're out of the playoffs race and not playing well, there's no reason not to put that guy in. You know, Indiana, in this metaphor, is out of the playoff race. Put your best talent on the field and let him grow. That's where we're at. And, and and I'm not saying it's over for any They're not going to make the turn, whatever. But you're at a point where it's not like you're killing it with the guys you're using. So what you should do is put your best talent on the floor and let him grow. I think you should play Geronimo more, as he has been. I think you should play Leo more. I know he had a scuffle with Archie tonight, so we'll see how that what, what comes out of that. Uh, Galloway, I think his minutes should probably go more of his minutes to Leo right now until – You know, because part of the reason Galloway couldn't find a seam in the second half, they were playing 10 feet off of him, daring him to shoot a three and he won't even look at the basket, which he shouldn't. His three point shot is horrible. But, you know, that that's part of the reason he's finding things a lot tougher than he did early in the season. The scouting reports out on him. He can't hit a three. So I just think that you need to start investing in the young guys because rolling with the older guys isn't doing anything for you. You're nine and eight. You're four and six in the Big Ten. You know, it's not working. So change what you're doing. And if you do get another year, you're going to have to count on those guys to there, to be ready, right? I mean, I mean that's where I'm at. I mean, realistic. It's, yeah, um, yeah. The plus players tonight. Uh, Rob Finnessy was somehow plus five. I don't know how. I mean, that's just a, a limited aberration. minutes. Yeah. Race Thompson played 37 minutes and was plus eight. Lander was zero. For a freshman in his first real extended look in a big game, that's pretty darn good. Galloway was plus three in 25 minutes, but I think he benefited from being on the floor with some guys who were doing some doing stuff. But I mean, that's telling right there. I think quite frankly, game to game, I think Trace Jackson Davis is your best player, but game to game race Thompson gives you more than anybody on this team. And he showed it again tonight. And I think Lander helped out a lot. Coach, I thought you were jumping in. All right. All right. Let's take a, let's take a break. It's, it's late. I'm getting later. Uh, all right, so when we come back, we're going to talk uh, more about IU 75-71 loss to Illinois. We'll point out the meaningful moment you might have missed and then go inside the numbers to highlight the most important statistical notes in the game. If you're listening to the Assembly Call. Stick with us.
This is Verdell Jones. What's better than an epic buzzer beater? The full court dribble and perfectly placed pass to set it all up. And, of course, celebrating with Hoosier Nation afterwards. So join Jared, Andy, Ryan, and Coach on the assembly call after every IU basketball game. Go Hoosiers. And welcome back to the Assembly Call IU Postgame Show. I'm Mandy Bottoms here with the coach Brian Tonsoni and Ryan Phillips, and we are talking about IU's 75-71 overtime loss to Illinois. And now it's time for... Meaningful moments that you might have missed. Figure this is a good good place as any to talk about Race Thompson. There was a lot of a lot of these for uh for for Race today. There was uh, his block on on Georgie, where it looked like they had a sure layup, he comes in from behind. Um, Volleyball that tomahawk uh, block that one. Allen's up getting fouled on the rebound when Georgie jumps on top of him, and IU hits two free throws to go up fifty one to fifty. It was another play where he did a really good job of screening off his man for Armand, to, who got a dunk in the first half. Um, then he got a steal on the other end after a loose ball. After it was a, a bad pass from Trey Galloway, had that touch pass that he made when Lander. Uh, threw it over his head, but he kind of saved it and threw it to TJD, who who ended up getting fouled and making free throws. I just thought, you know, this lots of little plays like that. I mean, Race made some some big plays as well, um, but just lots of little hustle plays on both ends tonight for Race, who ends up with 18 points on six and nine shooting, was six of 12 from the free throw line. Although that improved in the second half, I think the first half he was two of five. Two of, se- two of seven. Uh, I think he might have started two of seven, yeah. yeah. But he ends up uh, four of seven in the second half. But um, did that, ends up with eight rebounds, three steals, two blocks. Um, just a, a really solid performance from him and two assists, which was you know good for second on the team and um, tonight. So I, I thought a, a really good performance, both in, in big and small ways from him. So. Uh, Ryan, I know you touched on him a little bit at the end of the uh, the last segment, but uh, other thoughts you wanted to uh, or plays uh, that you wanted to talk through with Race from tonight? No, uh, he you know he just had a couple steals and blo- like you said, like weak side blocks and rebounds. I mean, he had eight he had eight boards and and he was against guys who were bigger than him. You know, he just outworks people, and he you saw it against Luca Garza in in Iowa uh, at Iowa. I mean, he just outworks people. And he's the guy, if you want to point to a leader on this team, I don't know if he's vocal uh, behind the scenes. I know Trace Jackson Davis is, but that's the guy everybody should emulate. The effort and intensity that Ray Thompson brings every time he's on the floor. We've seen, I think, one game where we thought, like, yeah, something's wrong with Ray. He's not playing that well. He, like, he doesn't even have to fill up the stat sheet. He just he does everything right. 37 minutes tonight. And he, he was Indiana's best player, I think. I don't think it was close. And I think consistently, as far as doing the little things and, and, and playing a full court game, I think Race is Indiana's best player. Um, Trace Jackson Davis puts up the numbers and is certainly the best offensive player, no question. But on both ends of the floor, with the effort and intensity, Race Thompson has consistently been Indiana's best player this year. Uh, I think that, you know, Armand Franklin got hurt. I think he was getting to that area where it might have been him. But, you know, since his injury, it hasn't been the same. I, I think Race is the, the team's best player and the guy you've got to look at as that's the example for everyone else. And you know where Race is right after the game? He's out on the floor ne- next to Christian Lander shooting right now because he knows he needs to get better. That's the guy you build your program around. That's the guy you point to to everybody. If this is the example of who you should be. So, uh, you know, Indiana did that with Victor Oladipo before. They've done it with Cody Zeller. They've done it with Yogi Ferrell. Those guys were superstars who put up numbers, but it's the same thing. You model your program after the guys who work the hardest, and he works the hardest on the floor. Coach, thoughts on race? You know, race does what race can do. Um, I, I like the mid-range jumper uh, that he he shot today. I, I, I love the, the fact that um, – you know, he, he's battling in there for rebounds and he's blocking shots. I mean, there's so much good about race's game, you know, and when you, you know, everyone has a part in a loss, you know, he fumbled that play out of bounds that could have given Indiana the lead, but my gosh, you can't, you know, not, no one's going to play perfect, but you can have perfect effort, you know, and Indiana was close to that perfect effort tonight. Um, there were, there were a few guys I thought at times didn't have that perfect effort, um, but yeah, race brings it on a, on a regular basis, and the fact that he's out there shooting, knowing that he missed some free throws, you know, that that's the thing, you know, um, a lot too. That uh, you know, these guys may not play well; they may not, 
you know, push the ball when they need to push the ball. But a lot of these guys, it means a lot to them. You know, to have guys out after a loss shooting uh, afterwards says a lot. Uh, and at some point, maybe the breaks, um, you know, even out at some point. Maybe not this year, uh, but maybe in another year. Uh, but race is going to be, you know, a big part of it, and he'll be back next year. And uh, But you, you have consistent effort uh, from him, and there's never a question about – what he's going to bring. Um, most nights it's backed up with solid stats. Every once in a while he'll have an off game, but uh, he brings it every night, and that's that's part of the reason that, you know, despite being 9-8, and eight, there, there's some good things to watch about this team, and he's one of them. Yeah, the other um... – other, one of the other moments, you know, Trey Galloway ends up leading the team in assists. It was one in the first half. I have no idea exactly how he was able to slip the ball through. To, I think it was Race Thompson. It was um, for a dunk or a layup, but a, a really nice drive. And, and I think you know, Ryan, you talked about how much he he struggled in the second half when the driving lanes closed down a little bit. I think it ultimately shows a, a little bit of his limitations right now as a freshman with a, a bad back trying to play, but. I also think it, it underscores it, you, you in in an ideal situation or anything resembling an ideal situation. You're not having to play him 25 minutes in this game. You're put in that position because your other guards are in, either in foul trouble or not producing. You don't have Jerome Hunter, which is a little bit less of an issue for Trey since Jerome's been playing a lot of four. But again, you could have thought about putting Jerome in at the three or something with Trace, and so he's out there when. On, on Archie's radio show on Monday, basically said Trey hadn't done very much work really at all, got in a little limited stuff, went to the you know, shoot around today, and you know they got him to play, and he goes out there and plays 25 minutes. And I you know I thought he played poorly at times and, and kind of overdrove things, but it just felt like because of either the decisions other players made, the shortcomings of other guys on the team, you're putting him in a situation that is probably unrealistic to expect him to be consistently successful in playing that that number of minutes and so you know i thought he did some good things put some pressure on the defense they adjusted iu doesn't really have other buttons to push at this point in terms of who else you go to um you know leal eventually came in for him in overtime there was a you know you mentioned it earlier leal gets called for an illegal screen there's a little bit of an exchange when he comes off with archie where uh Archie was quite clearly not happy with Leal, and Leal was chirping back at him a little bit. He barked at him, yeah, and you, Archie you turned can around immediately. Only, yeah, you can only assume that had a whole lot to do with him not coming back in the game until it was overtime. absolutely necessary in the overtime yeah. when things are going really poorly. But um, I guess it's not really a, a lead-up to any kind of question there. But, uh, Coach, uh, coach, thoughts on, on Trey? I know, Ryan, you, you shared a few things earlier, and I'm trying to keep things moving in the interest of time. Sure. But um, any, any thoughts on on his play. Trey's Trey's interesting cuz he's kind of, you know, he came in, he blew up right away and all the talk was about him and, and here here's the reason why. He he's a north south guy. Uh, uh you know, it's awkward looking at times and he jumps and he splits his legs and he fun guys and sometimes he gets to the rim and lays it in. Uh he, he's not a shooter. Uh, but what he brings to this team is a, a little bit of headiness, a little bit of basketball IQ and a little bit of that fight that we keep talking about that it seems like some guys have some nights and not have some other nights. I think he brings that consistently uh, as well. He's just got to work into uh, being a freshman and learning how to guard and 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 uh, you know, how to how to do certain things in the college game, but the the reason that he's become such a factor early is cuz he could put the ball on on the ground and probe the defense and, and find open people and create that north and south action. Um, I, I think that's telling after obviously after 17 games that um, besides Armand, we don't have that. And that's why he got elevated into the starting lineup. And I think why he got elevated in for Rob um, uh, back at the Illinois game, the first Illinois game. So I think his ability to go downhill and create some rotation uh, of the defense is part of the reason that he has seen some playing time. Obviously, teams scout and adjust, and, and so he's got to make another adjustment after that, which he's probably going through right now after his injury or even prior to his injury. Um, he's got to make that next next level as as these great coaches in the Big Ten make make their adjustments from scouting him and playing him certain ways. So he, he's got a lot, you know, um, a lot left to learn, but it's that downhill. And if I had one thing 
to suggest, not that Archie's ever going to watch the show or listen, is you, I think you got three guys that can go downhill, Lander, Armand, and Trey. Uh, and I think the discussions have to be, you know, we got the inside game with the two big guys. Uh, if we're going to open up some shooters, we're going to have to – everyone else drives and kicks, drives and kicks, drives and kicks. When we talk about modern basketball, those three guys would bring us to a little modern basketball, and maybe then that's Al Durham's spot is to st- sit out there and hit threes off of, you know, driving kicks. But that's Trey Galloway. Trey Galloway is a coach's kid. He understands the game. There's a little fight to him, and he has that knack for trying to get downhill. I think that's why he's played, and that's what he brings this team, and he'll have to refine a lot of the other areas to be really – a great contributor down the road. All right, let's uh, go inside the numbers here uh, as we continue talking about this game. Um, the second half offensive numbers are just gouge your eyes out. Terrible. Dismal. Um, Dismal. I mean, in the second half, seven of 21 from the floor, uh, one for four in overtime. So that's eight of 25 from the field there. Uh, a total of... Uh, 11 turnovers in the second half and overtime after just four in the first half, um, you know, assist numbers on it, you know, when you're not making shots, you're not going to rack up a ton of assists, <laughs> four assists in the second half and that overtime tracks. that tracks and uh, just points, yeah. points per possession in the second half. I don't have overtime factored in, but 0.844 like actually is higher than what I probably would have guessed it to be. <laughs> So Illinois in the second half was at 1.063. Yeah. I mean, in Illinois really, I mean, for large stretches at the end of the game, I don't want you guys mentioned this before. I mean, other than making free throws and in, in a dunk by Coburn after Frazier hit those two threes, I actually think there were two dunks from, from Coburn and those were the only two field goals. They made the rest of the game. Yeah. Um, and, and here's the thing. That game was sitting on the table for somebody to take it. Oh, actually, and that's then, not true. They only made one made one field goal after Frazier hit those two threes. Sorry, I, and I that was the dunk, right? or that was yeah, a, it was the dunk, dunk at that toward the end of overtime. Yeah. So, no, it's the game was laying there for you know, and it's one of those things where they tied it, and you're thinking Indiana, like, oh, here it comes, they're going to hit shots on the next four possessions. Just going by history, they're going to hit, they're going to find open shooters in the next four possessions, or Coburn's going to get fouled and make all his free throws or or something, and then they didn't, you know, and so you're like, well, this game's here, the game is 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 there to be taken and Indiana just didn't go take it. I mean, it's, it was there. And and that's what we're going back to with that. Um, you know, with that killer instinct, there was nobody to go win the game. And, and, and that's a problem. It's just a problem when your mentality as a team is who's who is, is to get the ball in the perimeter and pass it. Cause like, who's going to, who's going to go win this game and nobody catching it and saying, I'm going to go do it. Now, Armand did it on that last drive. He did, but, with him injured, somebody else has to step up, and nobody did. The game was there to be won. Yeah, I mean, and a lot of the other stats are. Right, go ahead, coach. Uh, here, here's one thing, too. I, I know we're in the stat segment, but um, Archie's going to have to look at that out of bounds defense because coaches are starting to scheme against it. Did you guys notice Illinois' yeah. uh, scheme? Yes. They were they weren't set. They were circling. They were just running in a circle, and then the guy would slap the ball, and they would break. Um, and then that caused confusion on who was going to start with who. And then Finnessy after- fouled out. Finnessy yeah, fouled out because they absolutely. Did that. Um, I thought that was pretty creative by um, Illinois to to run that. Yeah, Painter ran some different things, so you know uh, I didn't see it. You know there were a couple out of bounds plays that cost us some points, and then it went away in the second half. So maybe there was an adjustment. But I thought um, I thought that was an interesting way to counter a, a solid you know pre switch uh, defense. Uh, and that's that's what happens in in this conference too. And again, not making excuses, but you 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 pick up a good out of bounds defensive idea, and it works for four games, and then you run into a coach who has an even better idea, and then it blows your great defense out of the water. Then you're forced to go back to the drawing board and come up with another uh, another solution um, that keeps you on your toes. But I thought that was an interesting um, idea by Underwood. Yeah, there was uh yeah the the play where you know Frazier basically just gets Finnessy on his back. I, you know, there's it's a part of me that I'm not really sure what else Finnessy is supposed to do in that scenario other than you know stop trying to fight through him at some point. But there's always I, I always find myself asking that. I was like, well, what what is the guy supposed to do? But that's 
Neither, neither here nor there. Um, you know, shooting wise, I well, Rob's supposed to get under. Rob's well, supposed to get under a switch. Well, once you're, once you're not spot. though. <laughs> yeah, once, once you're not, once you're not, gotta... there's only so much you can do. Um, yeah. But you know, IU only shoots eight three pointers for the game. They're four of eight in in total, uh, which makes them eighteen of forty six on twos, which is atrocious. Um, I'm going to retweet the shot chart that Andy Witchery put out, which is just unbelievable. There's basically like no shots from the wings from IU. It's wild, um, not in a good way. Um, but but a lot of the other numbers, uh, you know, another one that really sticks out the the 15 turnovers for IU is one thing in total. But Illinois ends up with 15 points off of those turnovers uh, compared to just five points off turnovers for IU. You know, in a game when a lot of the other defensive numbers are fairly close outside of bench points. Um, there weren't a ton of differences, but like that one really stands out as you look through. And and again, the free throw shooting uh, ends up twenty three of thirty four, which it, it felt worse at times than that. You get your two big guys to go to the line a total of twenty two times, uh, and they're thirteen of twenty two between the the two of them. So you know, those things are disappointing. They also were the two guys who led the team in scoring and rebounding. So uh, you you give some and you, and you take some away. Defensively, though, I mean they hold Iowa Sunmu to. You know, two of eleven from the floor and ten points. Um, you, you know, you'd be hard pressed to to go into the game and say you hold Io to ten points and he fouls out. Yeah, with that much feel, time left, you'd feel pretty good. Uh, you you would think, but uh, any other numbers stick out to you guys as you uh, look over this one? Well, I'm shocked that they out rebounded them. You know, I mean, just with Co- Coburn and the size they have. Uh, they out rebounded him. Indiana out rebounded him, thirty eight to thirty seven. I mean, that's close, but they out rebounded him. And, and the big stat that jumps out, and Archie always talks about, it, and you know, whatever. I think he 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 glosses over their shooting issues, but this one he takes seriously, and he's right. His turnovers, fifteen to ten, you know, fifteen turnovers, and a lot of them were in the second half and overtime, and it's that that loses you games. The, the two places they 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 can always point to when they lose, almost always. Well, not always with the turnovers because they were better for a while and lost a few games. But the two areas are free throw shooting, three, and I'll throw three point shooting in earlier in the year. But free throw shooting and and turnovers, you can look at immediately and be like, well, did they win the game or did they lose the game? It's pretty obvious based on this. And you know they shoot sixty seven percent from the free throw line and lose by four, and you were in overtime. You know. Yeah, Ray Thompson makes a few more free throws, and he look credit to him; he's out working on it right now. But he makes a couple more free throws. This game doesn't go to overtime. The turnover issue is is disturbing yep. when you have senior guards who throw the ball towards the wing and it gets picked off for a home run. That hurts your defensive stats. Um, but Al Durham did that. He had two turnovers in the first four or five possessions. Soft of the second wing half. passes. Yep. He had one on the wing, and then he had one real soft where the defense was already around right. the post, the, the the elbow guy, and it was just a bad read. Um, you, yeah, that's where the play is designed to go, L, but you don't have to throw it at the defenses there, and that's just mind-boggling as a coach to say, you know what, yes, I want you to throw it there by design, but not if the guy is being guarded. Uh, do you throw it in there? Um, you know, so yeah, the one on the that, wing was the same. I mean, they're running yeah, screens yeah. for baseline screens for, for Armand. Armand. At yeah. no point was he open as he no, came around. He wasn't open. At All no you point was pass any of the five screens he came off of on that possession. He was you pass great. fake yeah. and then cut back, you know, back door, and you got to catch on the wing, or you can drive off of that uh, when when they're putting the pressure on like that. That. That th- those are those are things, and again, maybe that's a practice issue. Maybe that's just a player under game slippage issue. We we just don't know. Um, but the more you know, you got to put players in position to be successful. And I think where Al Durham helps us is coming off screens, curling, hitting jumpers, getting a driving kick three, and shooting when its feet are square to the basket, shooting threes. I'm not sold on him running the offense and trying to get us into offense. Um, and, and again, I'm not there at practice, so I don't know what's going on. And maybe with Lander not being available and Rob struggling a little bit, you had to find someone else to to bring the ball up. I, I don't think Armand's a point guard. I think Armand's an off guard closer type. Um, and that that's where I'm saying now it's it should be point guard between Rob and Lander. Uh, and whoever's playing better gets the minutes and just keep going back and forth, back and forth and play those two because those guys are going to get you in offense. Um, but, but boy, those turnovers, Ryan, you're absolutely correct. When you have a seven-point lead and you make 
two entry pat. You're not even in an offense. You know, and, and Indiana has enough problems when they run offense uh, of, of hitting shots when they get shots. Uh, but when when your guards don't get you into the start of an offense, that's a struggle. It, it, it's, it's so the turnovers to me were the big, big part of 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 the loss. I, I agree wholeheartedly with you that, um, and, and it's just been an issue most of the year. Yeah, I mean, you just yeah. look at the at the beginning of the second half. This is what was I, I didn't mention this earlier. I think got lost in all the other frustrations, probably, but. You know, you're up seven coming out of the locker room. You get stops on the first three possessions defensively, and you don't score a point, and you don't extend that lead. If you if you come out sharp there and are able to get into something, get shots that you want, get the ball going toward the basket, you you got a chance to build a double digit lead right out of the gate. And, and they you know, race misses two free throws. Trace misses inside. Armand takes a bad shot where he got you know the shot clock's running out, and he had to take a shot. You know, but even then, you know, they make a three, come back, Armand hits a jumper, then Leal turns it over. Then Al hit is one of those turnovers. I think it's the uh, I think it's the one on the wing it to was Armand. The wing, yeah. Then, you know, Race makes a, a floater and then Al comes back and turns it over. It's a second play that, that coach said. It's just like a- any chance that they had to really pull away and create separation was gone, you know, six, eight possessions into the second half. And now you're in for a dogfight with no margin for error, as we talked about before, with a limited bench, all that stuff, because you came out so bad out of the locker room at halftime. And I'll say this, too. Think about overtime. When Armand comes down and makes that... I would prefer not to. Okay, well, that's fair. (laughs) When Armand comes in and makes that shot to tie it, you have momentum. You've You've just scored to take it to overtime, essentially. And you get a stop on defense... You get the ball and, you know, it's a last end of game play or whatever. You're just chucking it down the, down the court. But you have come back and tied that game. Those guys should have been fired up going in overtime. I know they were tired. They've been playing a lot. There should have been some juice on that court. And they get into the offense and it was just bland. The, they were half cutting. They were, you know, dribbling side to side. There, there was no plan. There was no execution. There was nothing. It's like you guys just tied up the number 12 team in the country and have a chance to go out and win this game. And it just felt like everybody was like, all right, what are we going to do? You know, instead of let's go win this. There's just a, there's an attitude about this team. And I think they fight hard and I think they play hard, but it's not focused energy. It's let's run around and play defense and close out and do hard things. Let's make our cuts and do this. But there's no, all right, I'm going to make this cut and then I'm going to take it and do this with it to do this so we get this. It's just, it almost feels like wasted energy. Like they're they're just running hard and cutting hard and diving on the floor, but there's no plan for, okay, let's do that. Then what's next? You know, and it just feels like that next step is missing. and It's been missing and I keep harping on it, but it's just, they had that game. They had every opportunity to win that game. Same thing with the Wisconsin game. Every opportunity to score a big win. And it was just, okay, let's go out here and play. And it, 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 there's something about that that just feels off, especially given the name on the front of that jersey. There's something about that that feels off, about not constantly just having a, a, a mindset and a mentality and a plan to go win the game. All right. Well, here's um here interesting ahead, to look at the possessions in overtime. Um, offensive foul by Race Thompson. I, I forget what that was at four thirty five. Was that a? He, it was a bad. He charge ended up getting at the elbow and just it just a drove. Charge. Yeah, too too yeah, long of a drive to think nobody's going to. Yeah. When that one official, that one official was going to call a charge, even if the guy was they called three. Ch- the guy, same speed. guy called three charges that were all bad calls. Yes, absolutely, and he was horrible. So there, there was one, and you got the ball to one of your better players, and he charged. Then you go down, and the next one was a missed layup by Trace Jackson Davis. So that might have been a like an outside the lane one. I don't know if it was clear, but you got the ball to Trace Jackson Davis, and he missed at three thirty nine. Then the next possession was an offensive foul on Trey Galloway, another charge. Right, probably a bad decision for him to drive. Uh, but that was a yeah, bad guy call slid at, under him, at, yeah. at 259. So there's two bad calls, and your best player misses misses a shot. Then um, Trace Jackson Davis missed jumper at 205. That was, that was, a, that was, that was the air ball. Right? That, was the, air that ball. was the air ball. So he gets two shots. You have two drives to the basket and two shots by your best player. 
And then then it's a missed step back jumper by Al Durham at 120. So that's the first play that you I mean, you got the ball three three attempts to your post players. You know, now was it the right calls in the right position? But when you go back and look at it, and now it's 70 to 68. Uh and then then the then the the really tough play was the offensive rebound uh where um at 43 seconds we get the rebound and it gets batted up. Armand got it and the guy just makes a nice play and then we have to f- uh, play it out to the 19th second. If we get that rebound, we have 43 seconds to go down and get another ch- chance at it. So I, I know the offense was stagnant in there, but TJD had two two shots. He had a shot at the end of the game. Uh, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it wasn't like we were going to, you know, Cooper Bybee or something there at the end, and he might make it, you know. Um, yeah, there Two was- bad calls and two shots by your best player. Yeah, that was one of the that was one of the plays by Trace. I forget which one it was that that Coburn gave him. If he'd gone to his right, he was there. But he like forced trying to use his left hand and go baseline that wasn't there. And then I think he spun back. I don't remember if that's the one in overtime or if that was toward the end of regulation. But there's no need to. It's one a.m. There's no need to belabor that. All right, let's take that's, a break. That's the stuff that makes you bald as a coach. <laughs> okay, right. you got two charges and your best player misses two shots in overtime. <laughs> And, and you know on assembly call, they're going to call it, say you didn't run anything. Absolutely. All right, coming up, we're going to hand out game balls, hit any other lingering storylines, and go to bed. Uh, then we'll look ahead to IU's next opponent, and then it'll be time for last call. That's all next on the assembly call. Stick with us. Zizloft, I never miss an open three, and I never miss an episode of The Assembly Call. And welcome back. You're listening to The Assembly Call IU Postgame Show. Catch us live immediately following every IU basketball game, plus every Thursday night at our website, assemblycall.com. And while you're there, make sure you sign up for our free IU Hoops email newsletter. Over 7,000 of your fellow IU fans have already subscribed. You can also text IU to 66866 to subscribe to the newsletter. Again, that's IU to 66866. I'm Andy Bottoms here with Coach Brian Tonsoni and Ryan Phillips, and we are breaking down IU's 75-71 overtime loss to Illinois. And now it's time for game balls. Uh, In the interest of time, I think this will be easy. Uh, Coach, I'll go to you first. Oh, geez. Race. Race. How about that for time? That was good. I like it. I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, I think I think race was the uh, obvious choice. Really set the tone. I thought when he was matched up on Coburn, did a good job. And, and he's a guy who, you know, against an Illinois team, they didn't play Georgie and Coburn very much together. Uh, so race was at times, you know, having to play defensively on the perimeter, and and really continues to be a guy that you can trust to guard multiple positions. Thought thought he played well on that end. Uh, was you know did a lot of the things that make him successful rebounding. And as I mentioned in a meaningful moment, did a lot of little things uh, as well that that added up. So um, disappointed for him that that you know he missed some of the free throws. And as Ryan mentioned, you near know, people talking about he's out working on it. He was totally gassed. I think that charge at the end of the game kind of took it out of him. He seemed to have a little bit of trouble getting his breath back after that, but. Uh, a really, really strong game from race, and I think was uh, the pretty clear choice for the uh, for the game ball. So uh, that will uh, make I'll make it unanimous and give that to him, which I believe is his second game ball in the season. If this tally on here is correct, uh, all right, and now it is time for. All right, Coach. Ms. Galinch was the only thing cheering me up tonight. Uh, it's, we do what we can. Uh, Coach, who, who you got for the uh, Real Hustle Award? I, quite Man, frankly, this, I'm this tempted was... to give it to Race to give him both. Yeah. <laughs> it would be unprecedented. You know, but you mean, Diving on the floor and doing everything. I mean, I kind of, I don't know. Um, I don't know if it's Real Hustle or just you kind of want to reward Lander for playing well. Um, I know he gave up those threes and people are going to remember that and – and, and I don't know that it was perfect, but here, here's a guy that was forced into playing. I thought he was the best guy running the offense, uh, and he nailed a couple threes. Uh, he took shots within the offense, uh, didn't force it. I don't know if that's hustle. Um, you know, trying to think down down the the line, I don't I don't know that anyone else uh, really, other than race, 
met any dive on the floor or hustle for block shots or got a big steal at the start of the second half like race. So I wouldn't be opposed to giving it to race. I'm a throw out Lander just, just to say again, I'm proud of him for sticking with it. Proud of, uh, of everyone for helping him develop. And I hope that this is just a step forward, um, for the young man. Cause I think we need him. I'm going to give it to the officials for calling 54 fouls tonight in 45 And keeping minutes. us here till 105. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Thanks, guys. Numerous uh, clock yeah. reviews, the whole the whole nine yards. They, yeah, they were yeah. atrocious both ways. Yes, they were. And and look, and I think it's Indiana, not why IU lost. It was no, an atrocious no. both ways. No, and I think Indiana actually benefited from some of those calls yes. clearly. But an average of 19 fouls a half virtually because you had the overtime too. But, I mean, think about that. Indiana had 28. You know, so it's 14 and a half. I mean, it's just crazy. Anyway, uh, no, I'm picking I'm picking Armand Franklin for toughing it out with the injury and, and making that big play late. Um, I, I don't think it was if you look at it in the grand scheme of what he's done this year, it wasn't a great game for Armand. He made some boneheaded plays and he didn't play his best, but he's also playing hurt. And I think that during the game I was pretty upset with him, but the rec- the realization that yeah, that kid's toughing it out and he made that big layup at the end and showed up. Um, I'm I'm giving it to Armand for for doing his best, and he guarded Kofi or er, uh, Ayodesumu all night. So I that was as a much key. As he could, yeah. That, that's a great point, Ryan. As much as he's hurting, you know, two of eleven, whatever you said, IU was, and and IU's just a terrific player. That that went unnoticed by me too uh, for a while there. That that that's really a gutsy. I changed back. I'm going. I'm going with Ryan. Ryan changed my mind. Yeah. That that that's pretty gutsy, and 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 that's hustle right there. All right, I like it. I'll make it unanimous because it really doesn't matter either way. But uh, I, uh, but no, I thought again, kind of gutting it out. I thought I would have loved to see them get him the ball more uh, in overtime if they could have, just because he he was a guy that if anybody's going to be a closer on this team, it, it felt like it was him. But you know, stepped up, made the big shot. The defensive stuff is is good, and I think his uh, you know mobility was limited, but but didn't keep him from wanting that challenge of being able to uh, to guard Ayu. So. Uh, I think that's uh, I think that's fair. Um, you know, the only guy that we haven't talked a ton about, and I know we've alluded to it at times, was was TJD. I, I, he's kind of woven his way through different points. He ends up with 19 points, 14 rebounds, took 18 shots, seven of 10 from the free throw line, a couple blocks, three turnovers. You know, kind of a mixed bag uh, for him, and, and struggled at times with with Coburn as he has uh, in the past. And I think that the shooting numbers reflect that. Did step out. Uh, and make a couple jump shots, which was a, a positive development for him. Uh, one of which was at the end of the half, but didn't want to, you know, go go the whole show without really talking about a guy who had 19 and 14. But, um, you know, ultimately, I thought there were some key moments that that they needed more from him, uh, and even some of those came earlier in the game. And they, they pointed this out on the the broadcast that you know didn't run hard up the floor, and Coburn ends up getting a putback as a as a result of it. And it's easy to look back and you know nitpick some of those things in what turned out to be a really close game but um i think he corrected that at points later in the game and, and seemed to play harder but there was you know kind of some up and down m- moments from him uh, coach any any quick thoughts on tjd yeah sometimes you know he plays like a sophomore at his age you know um and lets things get to him uh my, my son and i were talking a little bit about you know you're 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 two for eight and you and you get a dunk and you scream at the bench, which should have been a technical because they gave a technical to the to yeah. the Illinois guy first one. You know what? Seven for nine, go scream at the bench. And, and I know you need to play with an edge, and I'm all for playing with an edge. And I think Indiana guys need to play with more of an edge. Um, but sometimes, dude, dude, you gotta you gotta be there all the time uh, before you can scream. And, and but it, but that happens with with young kids, even very talented young kids sometimes will get caught up within the game what tjd does is though he always ends up with a really good stat line even in games where you think he's not playing well that's just how good he is but he has a lot of room to improve um his post moves getting better angles and not just trying to go through people and shot put the ball with his left hand um you know he's got to work on his game in order uh to, to be the complete player he can be for Indiana. And if he has any aspirations to go on the next level, he's got a lot of work to do. Uh, but it's sure nice to have him, uh, even on a bad night, uh, to have a, have a young man like that. But, yeah, sometimes young guys play like young guys, uh, even though you expect them to, to be there uh, every possession. Yeah, so in terms of upcoming – shows and and opponents uh next next show we'll do assembly call radio on on thursday as normal and then the next game is iowa uh, a noon tip so we go from the nine o'clock 
weeknight tip to the coveted 12 o'clock noon Sunday tip. Uh, what are you guys trying to do to me? Seriously? When Iowa comes to, uh, it's 109 a.m. here. I, I, I don't want to hear it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, Iowa, interestingly enough, if the schedule is correct, so they played Michigan State earlier tonight, um, proved their defense, they did win, but their defense uh, proved to be the cure for what ailed uh, Michigan State team that had scored 37 points in its last outing, or, or one of its last outings. Uh, they did give up 78 points to Michigan State tonight, uh, but won 84-78. They turn around and play Ohio State, according to the schedule that's on Ken Palm, on Thursday, and then travel to IU on uh, on Sunday. So they've got a number of games uh, kind of jammed in the week. So maybe that plays to IU's advantage. Uh, we'll uh, we'll see about that. We can talk about that a little bit more uh, on Thursday. But that's the next game for the Hoosiers. And uh, just remember to check out our friends at Home Field Apparel. Use the promo code Assembly Twenty at checkout to get twenty percent off your entire order. And uh, it's time for a a a late last call uh ryan i'll uh, i'll throw it to you first yeah i just think that and i speak for a lot of fans when i say i'm tired of seeing games like this i mean archie miller went on his radio it went on post game and said we're definitely getting better and it's like i think individual players are getting better i'm not i'm not certain that this team is is necessarily improving as a whole because we're seeing the same things over and over and over again particularly in late game situations i hope he proves me wrong and i hope they prove me wrong but it feels like we're watching the same script unfold for four years now that they play good teams close and lose late and then when they face teams they should beat they play close and lose late like it's, you know, and, and they'll get wins in there and everything. And it just is weird. And it, it, there's no rhyme or reason to what happens. But late game offense has been an issue for this program for years now. And it just doesn't seem to be getting any better. And I know coach pointed out, look, you got the ball in the hands of your, you, you know, your best player a couple times and he had a chance to do it. But that was a best player who all game was shying away from going right at the guy he needed to go out to win. And, and, and so maybe you draw something up to switch it up and, and change, do something different. And maybe you, you draw something up for Al Durham with his feet set in the corner or, you know, something, you know, but doing this same stuff, I mean, let's be real. Kofi Coburn is, is Trace Jackson Davis's kryptonite. He, he just can't, he doesn't play like he normally does against that guy. So maybe you go away from it or do something else. I don't know, but I feel like we're watching the same game over and over and over again. And when, and when it comes down late, when these games are close and Indiana has a chance to win it, they just can't get over the hump. And that's been the story of this program for a while now, not just under Archie Miller, but before that just can't get out of their own way and can't get over the hump. And it's, it's just frustrating. And so I'll go back to what, what Andy said. He asked me about negativity and the negativity I have towards this team right now. I don't hate these kids. I like these kids. I like all of them. They're all good kids. You know, even, even Jerome Hunter, who was suspended for a game, uh, maybe more. I, I, I like him, you know, they're all good people. Archie Miller seems like a good dude. Seems like he knows basketball, but at some point that's not enough. You got to win games. If that's the, you're here to win basketball games and you have to figure out a way to win basketball. Big 10 sucks to go through as a coach. It's tough. It's brutal, but at some point you got to rise to the level of Illinois. Indiana should be on the level of Illinois. Indiana should be on the level of Purdue. It should be on the level as Wisconsin. And if a couple years in, and really over the last 20 years, Indiana's not at that level, there's a problem. And, and, and I don't know if it's just specific to Archie, if it's the program, if it's the, the way the athletic department or the school treats the basketball program. I don't know what it is. But we've seen this story play out too many times. It's not an isolated incident. And so there's something wrong here that needs to be fixed because Indiana should not be losing games at home to teams like Illinois, they should be on the level with Illinois. This is a good Illinois team, but you're close late and their best players fouled out. You win that game if you're Indiana. They shouldn't be getting blown out by Purdue repeatedly at home. They shouldn't be losing to Northwestern at home, and they sure as hell shouldn't be losing to Rutgers at home. That's where the program is right now, and you can make excuses in-game. Well, they had this chance, and they missed a shot, and this, whatever, but overall, you look at the track record. This is what it is. They're losing these games at home to teams they should be beating. It's not good enough. It's just not good enough. And there's no excuse for it. And it needs to be fixed somewhere along the line. Something's off and it needs to be fixed. Coach. Yeah. For, for me, it's, uh, it's going to be starting to watch the young kids develop, uh, you know, uh, hopefully get some wins and, and make the tournament. That's still there. I think 
uh, because any win in the Big Ten is going to build your resume, and, and, and you know there's opportunities starting on Sunday, uh, and, and you know um, you get another win at, if you can get a win at Northwestern. I know those are big ifs, um, but I'm really going to watch the young, the development of the young people, and try to enjoy that because regardless of what happens this year, they'll be back hopefully next year. Um, again. I'm going to worry about the things I can control. I can't control what's going on there in practice or what the AD's thinking or all those things. Um, but, I, but I enjoyed uh, seeing Lander. I've seen, enjoyed Geronimo, Leo, uh, those guys come out, and, and hopefully they have continued improvement. And then the other thing I'll say to, to fans, too, it is frustrating. Uh, losing just is awful, uh, and it hurts and as a fan. It hurts as a player. It hurts as a coach. Uh, but try to you know watch a game. And watch a game as critically as you watch Indiana, but watch two other teams uh, and see how many times uh, they, they give a direct drive to the basket and how many times they give up an open three and everything. Uh, all of us really look at at Indiana because we, we love the Hoosiers and we look at them for every possession, every pass, everything. Um, you know, and, and what you're going to make mistakes within a game. It, it, the team that wins makes the, the fewer mistakes. That's an old night adage. Uh, and Indiana's not doing that enough. Um, and, and it does need to be fixed, and, and whatever whatever it is. But, you know, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue to, to, to watch the development. I'm going to continue to watch Armand and some of those guys uh, develop uh, their games. I, I think that's just where I'm at right now as a fan. And, and um, you know, be there on Sunday and hope they get a win and stay above 500 and have a chance to go to the NCAA tournament. And, um, you know, winning's tough. Uh, Jared shared that uh, Chris Beard conversation, you know, and if Chris Beard's getting, you know, shouted down at Texas Tech every time he loses, you know, basketball and coaching is a real tough gig. Uh, I know you get paid your millions of dollars to deal with it, but – I love the line where he said from the ABA coach, sometimes you're the peacock and sometimes you're the feather duster uh, as a coach. You know, right now the IU program's a, a bunch of feather dusters, <laughs> according to everyone in the chat and mob and Twitter and all that. And and you're a couple of ways win from being a peacock again. So um, you, you just got to wake up, put your big boy pants on, and go to work. Um, that, that's, that's the only response. So hopefully – you know they find that end of game offense, and they find uh, you know those few possessions that make a difference, and and put a streak together and get on the right side of this. Yeah, coach, you went largely where I was uh, intending to here. You know, looking back over these last couple of years, last time IU had a three game win streak was last December um, when they beat UConn on a neutral floor beat Nebraska at home in overtime and beat Notre Dame on a neutral floor. They, they have not won three straight games since then, unless I guess you count winning the final game of last season and then the first two of this season. But but that that's what they have to figure out a way to do in order to really play their way into the NCAA tournament is, is find a way to get some wins together. And to me, um, the answer to that probably starts with, with finding ways to give Christian Lander more minutes after what he's done tonight. We talked about it at the beginning of the season. It, the key to this was going to be how quickly he could develop and looking back over the last year and a half and saying, Hey, we haven't won three games in a row since then as a coach that says you probably need to make some changes and figure out something else to do and take some risks and push some buttons that you may not want to push and, 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 and move some guys into potentially lesser roles, but you got to figure out how to try to win games. And, and to me, that was the the thing that emerged most clearly tonight is he seems to be on a positive trajectory See if you can continue to build that confidence. See if you can ride that to something here as the season goes along. And if you can't, it gives him good experience that he's going to carry into next season, and it gives him a better look at some of these guys and trying to figure out how do I build around these guys, what are their strengths, what do they need to work on. People can argue that he's not going to be able to fix those weaknesses and all that stuff. Again, we don't have, you know, we don't know whether he can or can't. What we are trying to look at is how can this season be successful how can this season turn around and rebound from these losses and these close losses against good teams that if you want to look at the glass half full says you're right there against these teams well what's going to put you over the edge is what you got to figure out now as a coach and 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 to me that has to feel like more minutes for Christian Lander and and figuring out a way to get him more involved the offense looked better uh, on a team that that's weakness has been offense and that's weakness down the stretch was offense tonight. And in a number of these games, you got to find somebody who's a playmaker who can do something that other guys can't do. He made passes tonight 
that other guys in this team aren't seeing, aren't making, can't make. I don't know which, but um, but he made things go in a way that other guys weren't able to tonight. So you hope Armand gets a little bit healthier and, and you've got a, a backcourt to build around because we talk about the guard play not being good enough to win in the league. If those two guys are your guards of the future, the future has to be now uh, and and then figure out how to work everything else from there. doesn't mean go sit out Durham on the bench for 40 minutes. doesn't mean go sit Rob Finnessy on the bench for 40 minutes. But the allocation of some of those minutes has got to shift toward the toward those guys so that you can give them a chance to grow and, and see what they do. So uh, a, a disappointing loss, and um, you think a couple of these overtime games could you know, go the other way, what you're talking about with IU's resume and tournament prospects and all those kinds of things. But right now this team isn't one that's that's able to find ways to win these close games, and they got to figure out a way to do that from here on out or we're going to be dealing with the reality of not making the tournament again and uh, and figuring out what that really means for the future of the program. So, again, to me, you got to make some changes. I think you saw – Somewhat clearly tonight what those could be, uh, and at least in my opinion should be, and uh, we'll see how they come out against Iowa, uh, a team that, again, will uh, will make your offense, even even the least of offenses look pretty good. So uh, maybe that's a good thing in the, the magic elixir uh, for the IU offense and see what happens from there. But we'll be back on uh, Thursday night to uh, to talk more about some IU basketball related topic uh, and on Assembly Call Radio. we got to get back into the groove of having that and not having uh, – and not having games on Thursday. So we'll, uh, we'll sort that out and figure out uh, something to talk about with everybody on Thursday. And then we'll uh, hit the Iowa game on Sunday. So uh, with that, that'll do it for this edition of the assembly call. IU post game show. If you want to see us do the show live and be part of the live chat, make sure that you subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash assembly call. And don't forget to go to assemblycall.com or text IU to six, six, eight, six, six to join our free email newsletter. Special thanks to longtime listener Bob Thompson, who produced much of the music you hear on the show. And thank you for listening. We'll be back to talk IU Hoops again with you on Assembly Call Radio on Thursday. Until then. Take it from me, Juwan Morgan. Keep your elbows in, eyes on the rim, and go. Thank everybody for coming out. All right. I got to get out of here, folks. Thank you. All right, gents. You ready to sleep? I, uh, well, just, I got to go. I might just go the, into school. I got to go upload the podcast file so sleep will not come quite Get yet. some grading done. Just go into my classroom right now. Yeah. Indiana made two shots in the last 11 minutes of game action. Here's a fun Dustin DePirac number. I'll quote the whole tweet. He says, just pointing this out because it speaks to the foul-driven weirdness of the evening. Al Durham didn't have a field goal in the game's last 41 minutes and somehow ended up with 13 points. <laughs> he didn't have a field goal for the last 41 minutes of the game and still had 13 points. That's something. That He's the only guy, like he and Armand are the only two who can make free throws consistently, right? Like I'm not making that up in my mind. Like they're the two. I mean, TJD did okay tonight, but in general. Yeah, I mean, I think I think percentage-wise they, they're probably far and away. Lander if he gets opportunities. Yeah, yeah, be- he shoots his real low coach and he pulls it away way away from his body. A couple times yep. I've seen him. His, his stroke isn't doesn't feel natural. I think it work on it as he gets stronger, it's, it'll be easier. I think he's what six for six on he's the six year. For six for six. Yeah, he, he's yeah. six for six. Galloway's eight and nine. I don't know how Galloway's getting free throws. But in. if you, I, I legitimately don't. But if you look at the other guys, and this is perhaps as telling as anything. I mean, even for as much as we're like Armand and Al are the guys, neither one of them is over seventy five percent. I know. Um, it's yeah. It's, Armand's seventy three point eight. Al's seventy two point four. So. It's I not great. I, not great. Yeah. I don't know how you don't make it. Okay. So after this year, we'll, we'll let you guys go in a second, but after this year, you have to make some staff changes, right? I mean, if, if, if this ends up going off those staying off the rails, you got to make some changes, right? You can't just keep rolling with the same people. They've already made changes, Ryan. I think, that's I, hard, I think that's the hard part. I mean, they've you. made, they've made two changes. It's true. I, I mean, the buttons aren't being pushed. Whatever buttons need to be pushed, they're not I being know. pushed. I know. Uh, and, and I think it's not X's and O's. No, I don't, I don't think, think it's it is practice. Either. I think it is it is the whole mental and I think the team is not against each other. I don't I don't think there's any individual no, they're issue. tight. They're supposed to be they're tight. They're tight. But I but, think they get in these games and the weight of not pulling these out weighs heavy on them not mentally when tough. they get into these situations. I sorry, I cut you off, coach. No, it, it's um it's it's the get old, stay old. Well, the old's not acting old. 
Uh, th- that's just honest. They're, they're good guys, but they're not acting old. Uh, other than race, um, Joey Brunk can't be out there. Um, and, you know, Al does what he do, and, and so does Rob. But, um, you know, they're, they're not the alphas. Um, and so what happens is you got young guys who sometimes try to do too much, whether that's on defense or offense. You know, Armand does too much on offense with some bad passes and do that, but he's trying. Uh, Lander was out of position, but doing the right thing and tagging the ball screen, but it ended up costing us. Um, so you got young guys who don't have the experience. You want to lean on the guys who have experience right now, but you got one, one guy who's been around. He's still a sophomore too, who's, who got suspended. Um, and, and you know you got the other two guards. Guard play is everything. I mean, guard play is everything. And and the Cubello kid was nice. I know he has a lot of turnovers, but that's what I envision Lander being able to do is, is what Curbelo did in, in in creating some things. You just need that point guard. Yeah. Um, and, and it ha- to me right now, as much as I love Rob and he's from the area here, you know he he's just too up and down right now. And and um. It, you know, maybe those guys are best with bench minutes, where the pressure's off of them from having to play 34, 35 minutes and and do everything. I, I don't know. Um, Just need somebody to put pressure that, on the defense. That's what Curbella did. I mean, yeah. right or wrong, whether he was fumbling the ball through the lane or not, he he forced you as a defense to make difficult to decisions yeah. and do something. And, you know, you got late-game possession where Rob dribbles for – 17 seconds gives it to Al he dribbles for the next 10 and then throws up a shot at the end and you you're you you're not getting your better playmakers the guys you want to have the ball the ball in their hands because you're not even giving yourself a chance to get into anything at that point but that was yeah. the possession that I was like you know slowing it down a situation where you really need a basket and it's like Get somebody who's going to drive the ball and, and try to get it in the lane, especially with the foul trouble. I know they weren't making free throws, but, man, for a while there, they were scoring every possession, and it was because they were getting fouled. Here's and some, then they went away from that entirely, it felt like. Maybe we can talk about this on the, the on the radio show or something, but I had an epiphany as a coach, too. Sometimes you, as a young coach, you think you got to call all the sets and you got to have this and you got to have this, and what you do is you you create a mentality of, of I need to make the play – as it's called, instead of making the play as I see it. Uh, and I think Indiana plays tight on offense. And other teams, I watch some of these other games for bracketology. I've got four TVs on here. Some dude catches on the wing, guy's in his face, he's like, screw it, I'm shooting. Bam, goes it. in. And yeah. makes it, right? And we are so tight to run every possession perfectly. And then we're so tight that I got to score. So I'm I'm 12 feet out, and I got a post move into a chest of a seven footer. So I'm going to throw a semi kind of softball. But I, I learned I learned this after my son played AAU. Is if I ever get back as a head coach, you're going to play great defense. And if you get a rebound, if you get a stop of any kind, whatever the heck you want on offense. If it's bad, I'll tell you at the timeout, or I'll tell you at halftime. You made a bad decision. But I, I, if I coach again, I want my guys playing free on offense. Get the ball down, pull up from three, shoot it, whatever. You earned it because you played defense. At the worst, we're even, 0-0. Zero, zero. Um, and, I, I mean, there would be concepts. Like, we'd, we'd be a motion team, or you, we'd run some things. But you guys have the freedom to take shots and make plays. Because so many times when you run sets – and I don't know if this is right at the college level or not, but depending, if you're a real hard coach and, and a tough-minded coach and you're like, got to do this, got to do this, got to do this, then, then good-minded kids who want to do well will do that. You know, you, you need to play a little you, – you need a Rucker Park dudes. Give me the ball. Give me the ball. I'm scoring. I don't care what you called, coach. Give me the ball. Yeah, he called Utah. I'm running. Give me the ball. Offense. You know. So, so to – to sum up, Coach wants Devontae Green back. I think we're good. Yeah. Mm, I guess so. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> was that not the? Was that not where you're? What you were driving out there? I know what you're saying. I'm just Somewhat, giving you a hard, I'm just giving you a hard time. I mean, because when did Devontae play well? When yeah. he was free and he made shots, right? Yep. And yep. then you got you, you bring a guy down like that, but maybe but you need a guy who's a little bit more understandable. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm just I'm just giving you a hard time. All right, let's wrap it up. I gotta get this file posted and thanks yeah, everyone. And all yeah. that. Thanks so, guys. Cool. Thanks we everybody. A, we need something different every once in a while. Pizza review 
Thursday night or something. I've always mm-hmm. said, anytime you guys want to talk burritos, I'm here. Yeah, let, burritos. let's talk food or wine or something on Thursday. Assembly call something other than. I like it. All right. Whatever. Later, let's guys. work on that. All right. See you guys. Bye. Thanks, everybody.